Okay, so this is how the images are produced. And this is a, um, an actual picture of, of an actual thermogram being performed. Um, and that's the, that's the camera there. Uh, there's a computer image of what a thermogram looks like. And then there's a the little camera just to the right of that. It's kind of like a big bread box, basically. And the, the point is that there's no compression. Uh, nothing touches the patient. Um, and all these things are very, are very popular. And because there's nothing that comes out of the cow, unlike a mammogram, we put the energy through the breast. Um, in, in the ionizing radiation, the energy comes from the outside, goes through the breast, and that's how the image is produced. The thermogram image is produced by a person's own energy. Um, won't go into it much tonight, but it always fascinates me. It's called digital infrared thermal imaging. It's the image is actually produced by the infrared light that all living things emit, um, which happens to be virtually 100% the same as the temperature. So yes, we're, in, we're really imaging the light, but we can really, it's kind of a one-to-one -one, uh, thing with the, the correlation with the surface temperature. So that's really what we're evaluating. So this is, a, this is basically a normal thermogram, a typical what a thermogram looks like. There's an anterior view, um, there's two oblique views and two lateral views. And we could assign any color we want, but uh, the white is considered as the hottest, the red is the next hottest, then the yellows, the coolest are the greens and blues, blue is the coolest. Um, the computer could assign any color, but that's the, um, that's the accepted, um, protocol. And it's important to remember that thermography records skin surface temperature only. That's all it records. It's easy to look at a thermogram and kind of mentally try to make it into a mammogram because all of us, whether a physician or not, are used to seeing structural tests. All of the, um, virtually all of the radiologic tests are, are of anatomy. And it's easy to look at a thermogram and see a little red spot and say, oh, is that a tumor? Is that, we don't see tumors. You know, we don't see cysts. We see thermal changes on the skin that are associated with those things. So um, again, can yes. I just interject? Um, yes, please. The, um, that actually, the corollary to that is, is that thermography, thermographic results are independent of breast density, um, which I think is an important point. Yes, it, does, it doesn't matter how large the breasts are. It doesn't matter how small the breasts are. I mean, how uh, dense they are. Uh, the temperature is completely independent of that. So that's one thing that doesn't matter as opposed to the mammogram where breasts that are not dense, we can see much better. Breasts that are dense are a little harder to see. Um, and the key thing to remember is because thermal regulation of the skin is all done through the sympathetic nervous system. It's part of our autonomic, automatic nervous system, um, and it regulates the thermal temperature of the skin. So actually, what we're seeing in thermography, it's really a test of the sympathetic system. And as it turns out, Pathology, no matter what it is in the breast or any part of the body really, will affect the sympathetic system and that's what gives thermal changes on the skin. So the important part is, I would say virtually everybody that I talk to, and this is what I believed in the beginning too before I was trained to read thermograms, is we think in terms of breast cancer, oh, okay, we see the cancer, there's, there's what so-called neovascularity or new vessels or creates warmth around the tumor and that's what the thermogram sees and in reality that's not the case um if the, if the tumor gets big enough then yes you can see heat from the vascular around the tumor but in reality we're really testing the sympathetic nervous system and we're seeing the results of a disturbance in that um, which happens to correlate with pathology at different places in the body. Right now we're talking about breast. Um, and again, the thermography is basically we're evaluating temperature regulation. 
and again, I do want to emphasize, we only see the skin surface, the top five millimeters of the skin. We don't see deeper than that. Okay. Um, the other piece, the other part is, now these are two thermograms. So the question is, are these normal or not? And it's kind of a trick answer because you don't really know without, without a baseline and then a follow-up three months later to make sure that the patterns are stable because everybody's pattern, thermal patterns are different. Both of these, both of these people are normal. But I only know that because I've seen follow-up images. So the key thing is, rarely can you look at just one image on any given day and totally say that that person is fine because the patterns vary with everyone. So we really, the, the standard breast um, protocol is you do one today, you do a follow-up in three months to quote unquote establish a stable baseline um, and then go annual if people desire. And it's called a thermal fingerprint uh, because, again, it's very unique and it's, it's uh, different in anybody, just like your DNA, just like fingerprints, just like snowflakes. And this is an example of um, someone year one through year 15. Actually, there were more than this. I just sort of coned it down to this. And you can see from year to year, there may be some slight changes, um, but the patterns are the same. It may be slightly warmer, slightly cooler from one year to the next, but the thermal patterns are virtually the same uh, from year to year. And obviously what we would be looking for is a, is a difference. Um, this is a case where uh, this was a baseline on the top and then across the bottom there were follow-up thermograms at three months, six months, nine months, 12 months. Um, at the three month, uh, the thermologist thought there might be some changes. It looked like maybe some subtle changes. So rather than going to a year, they went to six months where there definitely were some changes. Um, a uh, mammogram somewhere along the road at three months or six months, I believe was normal. I think there's a mammogram like at nine months, nine months or 12 months, and they found a small DCIS. And this is, which is duct carcinoma in situ. It's the earliest type of cancer that we, that we find. And this is a key slide because really this is one of the huge things of thermography that it can potentially see thermal change. Again, this isn't a cancer that we're seeing. We're seeing skin changes based on a cancer that's deeper in the breast. And a thermogram, it's possible to see a breast cancer, the findings associated with the breast cancer earlier than a mammogram does. Um, but I have to say this, the, the key point to this is it doesn't always do that. It's not 100%. The one study that I read talked about about 70% of DCIS was seen on the thermogram prior to the mammogram. So it's something that it can do. It doesn't always do it like every imaging test. Nothing's 100%. Um, but when you talk about early detection, this is actually earlier detection, you know, when it does show it earlier. Um, it's earlier detection than a mammogram can do in these cases. Okay, so again, sort of an overview of thermography is there's no radiation, no compression. That's the huge benefit. Uh, potentially, it's the earliest detection that we can uh, do, sometimes up to 10 years earlier, um, which creates sort of a problem in the traditional medical world, the conventional medical world, because if there's a cancer developing, and we can't see it on our traditional tests, there isn't anything the medical field can really do about it. So we'll talk about that um, as we go a little farther, but it's a very important risk marker. Um, and this is where John uh, can, uh, can kind of take over. All right. Um, 
Yes, I'm going to use this slide and the next slide as a springboard to just discuss um, a little bit of the literature, in particular three studies that I think are particularly compelling in, uh, in um, making the argument in favor of thermography. Um, we're talking about uh, thermography as an important risk marker, and this is where I think that thermography excels. Uh, this is what thermography can offer that no other um, breast imaging modality can. Uh, there was a study um, that was published in Cancer in 1980 in which they followed over 1,200 asymptomatic women for 12 years who had normal mammograms, normal breast ultrasounds, but abnormal thermograms. And this is precisely the scenario that, that in part caused thermography to fall out of favor because it was thought originally that there were just way too many false positives and that this was not a reliable exam. However, in this particular study, uh, which as I said went on for 12 years, within five years, more than 30%, more than a third, almost 40% of patients developed breast cancer within five years. So the thermograms weren't falsely positive. Um, they were abnormal earlier than everything else. Um, there's another study which was published in 1985, which um, looks at individual risk factors and how significant each was as a predictor of future development of breast cancer. They looked at family history, they looked at parity, how many children a woman had, um, previous pathology, and also abnormal thermograms as risk factors. And of these, abnormal thermograms were associated with a 23% um, incidence of breast cancer within 10 years. This was three times higher uh, than a first order family history. And I've seen other studies that say that, um, that have, that claim that an abnormal, persistently abnormal thermogram can be up to 10 times more significant as a risk factor than a first order family history. And that's usually what we emphasize when we speak to women. We ask them, did your mother, your daughter, your sister have, have ever have breast cancer. So this is three to 10 times, an abnormal thermogram is three to 10 times more significant as a risk factor. Um, the, in this study, the only um, risk factors that were more significant were a previously abnormal breast biopsy. Uh, the other thing of note in this study is that as far as false positive thermograms go, over a period of 10 years, the number of false positive thermograms, in other words, thermograms where no cause was found for the uh, abnormal thermal pattern was less than 2%. And uh, finally, uh, these authors concluded that um, thermography was highly, I'm sorry, I misspoke. The authors concluded, and, and this study included over 11,000 women, that it was highly desirable to you, and I'm reading here, highly desirable to use screening resources such as mammography and ultrasound for women at high risk rather than for the population at large. And thermography as a risk factor and early warning signal can play a major part in identifying a high-risk population. Um, could you go, Tom, to the next yeah, slide? Yeah. So um, here, the uh, yeah, the sen the reported sensitivities vary. You see figures as low as thirty nine percent and as high as ninety eight percent. Tom and I are in agreement that the reality is somewhere in between. I think it's probably in the range of eighty percent. Um, early detection not consistent. Uh, it's, uh, that's interesting in that from what I've been reading, there are spikes in the sensitivity of thermography. A thermography, there, the sensitivity spikes for tumors five millimeters and less in size, then the sensitivity decreases and uh, increases again for tumors over two centimeters in size. So that truly it's 
best used is as an early detection tool. Um, I wanted to go back and talk about that 39% sensitivity. Uh, this happens to be my favorite study to talk about. Uh, it comes from radiology, and it was published in the journal Radiology, and it was published in 1977. And one of the things I like about this study is it's very often cited as the benchmark study that definitively debunked thermography as a viable breast imaging tool. Uh, as recently as uh, a year ago, I saw this article referenced, and again, I'm going to read in the following way. Uh, in 1977, Feig and his colleagues reported results of a very large study comparing mammographic and thermography breast cancer screening in 16,000 women. Sensitivity of thermography was 39%, specificity 89%. Authors concluded that thermography was not a viable screening tool. Now, if all you read is the abstract, 39% sensitivity is definitely the takeaway. However, if you go and explore the full text of the article, what you find is that objective criteria for thermographic inter interpretation were adopted late in the study. If you only look at the last 5,300 patients screened, the sensitivity of thermography increases to 75%. And this is using 1977 technology. The other interesting point was that far from concluding that thermography was not a viable screening tool, the author's published conclusion was that the use of thermography in selecting high-risk groups for follow-up screenings shows theoretical promise and should be further investigated. So this article that's so often used to discredit thermography actually shines a very favorable light on the technology. And uh, that's one of the reasons that I love talking about that. And uh, I'm going to hand it back to Tom at this point. Okay, what do we have? Okay. Um, remember I talked about establishing a stable baseline and it's important to, um, to uh, have two studies at least three months apart to, to find out what the thermal patterns are uh, what they normally are, what that person's normal um, is. And obviously, in terms of breast cancer, we're looking for something developing. We're looking for no heat to an area of heat, like the other slide I showed, the original one of the DCIS. We're looking for um, so-called hot areas or warm spots that are continuing to change. That's what we see with breast cancer. Um, okay. Um, I think maybe from two years ago, this was a case that I read actually, and um, you see on the uh, left side of the screen um, of April uh, 20, this uh, sort of diff kind of diffuse, um, more areas, um, pretty symmetric, a little more on the right than the left. It's not unusual for us to see that at all. And um, then this was the follow-up three months later. And there's significantly um, less warmth there, that the thermal patterns have, the overall pattern is the same, but everything is much cooler than it was. And this patient, uh, or this person, um, had undergone some herbal therapy and also uh, had a significant diet change. Uh, they were under the care of a um, holistic practitioner. And to me, this is one of the really big things, another big thing that thermography can do that mammography cannot. And that is that thermography can actually monitor a woman's breast health. A, a mammogram, they can find cancers, they can find them small, they do generally a good job, but all they're doing is looking for cancer. Otherwise, they don't really have a reason to exist. That's all they're showing. And this actually can show differences in, in different treatments and different diets. The thermal patterns can change. And that's the whole point of finding a cancer earlier before it's actually a tumor, when it's only cancer cells. Um, that's the time that a holistic practitioner can actually work on the diet, can do different kinds of alternative quote-unquote treatments 
to potentially reverse a cancer that's maybe developing, um, but not big enough to coalesce into a tumor. A cancer isn't a cancer from the conventional medical point of view until it's big enough for us to see. And in reality, it takes like eight years or so. Every cancer is different, but some studies show an average of eight years from the time the first cancer cell to the time it's big enough to actually see a tumor. And thermography really can potentially pick it up in that eight year period when it's early enough to potentially do something about it other than surgery, chemotherapy, and so on. So I really like this slide because it shows that the, the thermal changes go both ways. Sometimes with treatments, we can watch things improve. And what I've seen also is that in that way, thermography is kind of like biofeedback. When a person sees this and says, wow, you know, a dietary change made that much difference, they get very motivated. And again, that's something the mammogram doesn't, doesn't address, doesn't do. Um, I made this slide just to kind of show that really a thermogram is much better understood by the quote unquote alternative medicine, which is a term I don't like. I just use it because it's pretty well grounded in the culture. Um, but um, chiropractors, uh, acupuncturists, uh, doctors of Eastern medicine, uh, generally understand thermography a lot more when, when you think about it, it's, it's really evaluating our energy field, right? It's, 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 it senses the light that we emit. So it really is a whole different way of looking at things. So it's a more understood in the alternative world. It's less well understood in the conventional medical world where the structural tests like mammograms really predominate. So I think I like this slide. I made the slide, so I guess I like it. Um, <laughs> to, uh, to really, it really explains why you could have um, a questionable thermogram or an abnormal thermogram, take it to your regular doctor and have them go, this doesn't help me at all because it's a very different paradigm. The information is incredibly useful, but it's not useful to a breast surgeon unless you have a breast cancer. And, and ideally, we all hope to intervene um, in the disease process before the disease actually manifests, which is where thermography shines. Um, basically, uh, inflammation is a precursor to disease, and thermography is super good at finding inflammation. Um, so we're just going to go through some other things that are non-breast. What are the other... Um, uh, some of the other applications of thermography. Here's a 41-year-old with carotid artery inflammation. And this is a lot, uh, this is kind of one of my favorite topics, actually. It, 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 it's a lot like breast thermography in a sense, because this person has uh, obviously inflammation in both carotid arteries. Now, this person could go to uh, have an ultrasound, a Doppler ultrasound. You can have them you know, you can go to your doctor and have it, or they have screening things that you can just go to yourself, um, which may be normal, quote unquote normal. And again, the conventional medical view would be, well, see, I told you the thermogram wasn't worth anything. But in reality, what this shows is inflammation. It's excellent showing inflammation, which is a precursor. The endothelial inflammation is a precursor to stroke, to actual cardiovascular disease. Um, so this, again, is where a, a holistic practitioner can say, look at that and say, wow, there's inflammation there. It's probably worth doing a carotid ultrasound to make sure there's not a big plaque. But just because there's not doesn't mean that there isn't something going on. Um, and again, this can find uh, disease as it's developing before it's actually manifested. If this person, uh, this person might be at risk for having a stroke when they're 75, right? As this inflammation goes over a lifetime, over decades, that's what causes it. But if you become aware early, then you can change your diet. There's plenty of ways to decrease systemic inflammation. So carotid artery uh, inflammation is something that we see a lot. Uh, these are two separate patients. Um, the hands 
are nor they normally are the extremities are normally warmer from the top and they get cooler as they go more peripherally. That's the normal sort of range uh, gradients as as uh, on the bottom. On the top, you can see it's the reverse. The hands are very very red, very hot, and this is very typical for diabetic changes. Sometimes we can see this even earlier than the blood sugar rises. Uh, but a lot of times we see this. this is very sensitive. A lot of times we see this in somebody that doesn't really know that they have diabetes yet, maybe pre-diabetic. And again, it's not. It's the. It's due to the sympathetic changes, because um, uh, di the blood diabetes is known to cause in the periphery in the hands and feet. Uh, you want to do this one, John? This was yours. Sure. Yes. Um, this this was an interest. This was interesting. This was a sixty three year old with who had who actually came to us with a recent diagnosis of ulcerative colitis. And aside from the uh, and I pardon me for looking off to the side, but the images are on my second screen here. Um, aside from this clear vertical pattern of hyperthermia at the left lateral aspect of the abdomen, which is consistent with the colonic dysfunction, which we know this patient has, when we looked at her back, she's got um, a significant amount of hyperthermia over the sacrum, and that's interesting because there is a known association between ulcerative colitis and sacroiliitis, which is what I think we're seeing here. Um, and then the next slide. So this was a 55-year-old with a peptic ulcer, and uh, and this was confirmed with. Uh, we know this through endoscopy. Um, you could never make that diagnosis on the basis of a thermogram alone. Um, you can see a, a lot of asymmetric. Um, hyperthermia in the left upper quadrant of the abdomen. There's also hyperthermia extending um, superiorly into the chest in the midline over the sternum. Uh, that's something that we can see with uh, gastroesophageal reflux. Um, I don't know that that's the case in this patient. I do find that that um, finding is more useful in male patients than female patients because in females you often have uh, hyperthermia in the cleavage between the breasts. And uh, I think we're just about at the end here in terms of cases, but this is something I really like to show because thermography is a new paradigm in terms of the conventional medical model. And this was a case um, going from left to right. There's inflammation in the knee there. And the second image, you can see kind of some small little straight dark lines. Those are actually acupuncture needles. And they're in every image going towards the right. So these were images taken every five minutes. Um, did include every image. I think they went half an hour. Um, but you can watch in five-minute increments the inflammation decrease. And I really love showing this, this slide to physicians because um, I remember the first time I saw it, it's obvious here that thermography is doing something different than what we were taught in medical school because there's no vascular trunk here. There's no nerve trunk. There's no, um, there's no structural um, thing that is causing this inflammation to go away. There's no reason why, from a conventional medical structural point of view, you put needles in the knee and inflammation goes away. So one of the things I really love about thermography is I consider it a bridge between the alternative world and the conventional medical world. That if, if people just, if physicians particularly, just stop long enough to really understand what it is and what it does, it really leads to a much better understanding of what alternative quote unquote medicine is really all about. Um, in order to understand how these images are produced and what they can show, you have to develop a different understanding. Um, so it really is a new paradigm in terms of the conventional medical point of view. 
So uh, I think that's pretty much it for the slides. Um, did you have anything you wanted to add, John, before we go to questions? Um, just one brief thing. When we were talk, uh, just along the, you, when you talked about your uh, the carotids and that being uh, one of your favorite slides, an area that I'm increasingly interested in and hope because we live in a in a state where the weather is pretty nice most of the year and therefore um, is. Uh, is there's a lot of people who can engage in athletic activities throughout the year. Um, talking about precursors of disease, I've been reading about work that's being done primarily in Brazil where they're pre-screening um, soccer clubs, uh, football clubs, and uh, just at the beginning of each uh, season, uh, just screening the knees of all their athletes. And uh, if... Uh, if their one knee is hotter than the other, in in an in an asymptomatic player, it they're seeing finding that it's extremely useful in helping to prevent injuries because they can brace and tape the hot knee uh, in a way that they might not if they hadn't done the thermogram. So I'm hoping that that's something that we'll actually be able to exploit here in Tampa at some point. There's a lot of fascinating new areas. You know, I'm pretty, uh, I'm very intrigued also by the allergy testing um, that's relatively new. It's not being done in many places, but, um, um, you know, conventionally to do allergy testing requires 20 different needles, you know, under the skin to inject small little things. And with the thermogram, the substance doesn't even actually really have to touch the skin to give a thermal response. Uh, so it's pretty fascinating, and I, I see that as an as a interesting new area. Uh, so I guess we'll, whoever's there, I mean, we'd be happy to answer any questions anybody has. Just turn on your audio, though. So this is Nancy. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm a general internist, and I see a lot of people with prediabetes or at risk or all those things that you're identifying, uh, but it's still difficult to make, uh, get people to make lifestyle changes, including me. I mean, you know, I, I'm not above that either. Um, <laughs> I understand I understand this, is, this can be motivating because I think it's a visual representation for people. You know, sometimes they can't think about what diabetes is or see it or things like that. Are there any trials going on looking at this? Like, does it change people? Does it change their behavior or, or current trials in that way? I think in, in some ways, maybe radiology is outpacing, and this happens a lot. The technology is outpacing what we're going to do with it at a practical level um, in the office setting. I'm not aware of any studies. Uh, are you, John? Not that, not that talk about it in, if I'm understanding the question correctly, in the term, uh, terms that, that you like to use as, as it being a type of biofeedback and does this actually impact, uh, by getting this visual representation, does it actually change patients' behavior? No, I'm not aware of any studies. Um, although I would like to go back to, uh, there are several studies with full text um, versions of available on the internet <clears throat> search that have to do with screening feet in long-term diabetics. And there does seem to be some indication that um, thermographic findings can be predictive of who is going to develop a, a, a foot ulceration, which uh, if you can intervene before the tissue actually breaks down, has some potential benefits. That, that would be huge, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. What about people who have things like, for instance, women who've already had a breast biopsy and they have metal in there? Does that change the thermal print? Because you're looking at energy things, but now you have metal sitting there with it. Um, it doesn't seem to. No, it, do, it doesn't seem to, although if a, depending on the extent of the surgery or 
by well usually with the clip it's a it, 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 there's minimal tissue yeah. removed but um it is possible that if a woman's had extensive surgery that we might have to reestablish a baseline and you certainly don't want to do a thermogram within three to six months of a, wo a woman having any kind of surgical procedure or radiation to the breasts mm -hmm. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. yes. Um, just had a um, client come in, 17 years old, who suffered from, I might not say this correctly, gigantomastia. Gynecomastia. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. She had eight pounds of breast tissue removed from her breasts at the age of, I think it was 11, 12, something like that. And then following in the f following three years or so, she had additional um, what her mother called lumpectomies. So we just did a, her initial breast scan. And I am very curious about how much that kind of surgery is affecting a young woman. I mean, obviously, she's still growing. Um, but isn't, isn't the myofascial, the lymphatic system... Uh, the vascular system going to be greatly affected by that kind, that amount of surgery. Yeah. And so, are we are we still going to find a baseline in three months? Where we? Well, I would um, say, Tom? you know, at, yeah. I mean, my thoughts on that are that yes, I mean, that kind of surgery is going to really change everything in terms of the lymphatics and the sympathetics and all of that. So, I think that. But after that's done, you still can have a baseline. Now, if she's having surgery every couple of years, it's, you know, an issue. But mm -hmm. no matter what's really done to the breast, um, it may or may not change how it looks. I've seen lumpectomies where it doesn't seem to really change much. And then I've mm -hmm. seen them where it changes a lot. Um, but you have to then just reestablish, like John said, we kind of reestablish the baseline because we're starting – after this surgical intervention um, after that's done you know when you have a three or six month whatever it is stable baseline then it should be stable from then on okay hmm. i have another comment <laughs> Sure. Yes. I've seen just in this past month alone, and I've been scanning for over nine years now, um, thyroids. <laughs> there seems to be a real problem in this country with um, thyroid health. But um, a lot of folks that are having uh, just full body scans for preventative purposes, thyroids are coming up. And sure enough, they go for, uh, if they get a good thyroid panel performed, um, they are correlating very well with the thermograms. Um, yeah, I see thyroid a lot, you know, yeah. and I, I believe a lot of it's incidental based on the histories that there's nothing, you know, nothing mentioned in the history about it. I see it on a lot of breast scans. I see mm -hmm. it a fair amount. I, yeah, these I, patients are asymptomatic, and um, if they can get their practitioner to order a full thyroid panel... Usually, it's correlating real well with the thermogram. See, it's uh, and and that's good to hear. And yes, I see a lot of thyroid uh, activity over the thyroid, and um, I presume I, I usually presume it's thyroid. And if I see it and there's nothing mentioned in the history, I I will make that recommendation. Um, we're at a disadvantage, especially uh, not so much with Greenpoint, where we can obtain follow-up uh, more easily, but when we're doing um, interpretations remotely for for all of you, um, we don't always have the, in fact, almost never have the benefit of that follow-up. Uh, it would actually be useful to us at least to me, I won't speak for anyone else. Um, if you know, I did or did mention that in somebody who was asymptomatic who went on to have a thyroid dysfunction confirmed to actually get some feedback by way of email or through Susan. Um, 
Well, I know I, I personally do give that kind of feedback. I would love a form. So Dr. Bartone, if you could produce some kind of a, this is me 20 years in the military talking, right? <laughs> I want a form. So I would love to have something that, you know, is standardized and I'd be happy to fill it out and, and submit. And I think, well, I think most of the thermographers would. All right. When you say there's thyroid dysfunction, is it overactive or underactive thyroid, or does it, or is it variable? I would say that it's variable. I would say it's more often, more, more often over uh, function. And the and, and the pathology that I that I find most just and it's purely anecdotal, but that I find um, correlates most consistently with um, with an abnormal thermogram is a thyroid thermogram is something like Hashimoto's disease mm -hmm. where there's clearly inflammation at, at underlying as the underlying pathology mm -hmm. yeah it's not the same as like uh you know the the a hot nodule or cold nodule we talk about in medicine you know that's based on a on a nuclear medicine scan right that's what the definition of a hot nodule cold nodule is so um I don't think that that correlates exactly, you know, in other words, if it's hot, quote unquote, you know, if it's red on the thermogram, which was what I see most of the time, sometimes we'll see it be hypothermic. Um, mm -hmm. but most of the time it's hyperthermic, but it doesn't necessarily mean, you know, it doesn't fit that definition, that medical definition of a hot nodule. It just shows dysfunction, which could be a number of things. No, and Hashimoto's. There's there's a hyper there there's a hyperthyroid phase and a hypothyroid phase if it goes on too long, but um, it it tends to be hot, which has that has to do with how the thyroid is functioning. But the thyroid, the the bottom line is the thyroid is inflamed, and inflammation is going to show up as um, as increased thermal activity. Hmm. Cardiac. <laughs> Cardiac. Uh, well, I had a patient once who um, had a very hypothermic pattern on her um, A2P scan and, you know, on the, her left side and it was just so clearly round and blue. And the patient, after I spoke with her, had admitted to a, a funny episode. She called it a funny episode one night. Um, but other than that, could not you know, felt no problems. Um, she was Mennonite. Um, we have a lot of Mennonite and Amish people here in Iowa, and she, they don't go see physicians very often, apparently. Um, so the report did come back, um, suggesting that she maybe do some sort of cardiac stratification. But the interesting thing for this woman, and this speaks to what Dr. Hudson talked about um, when he was discussing the acupuncture screen, um, that this woman had heartbreak. It turns out she had a very sad story to tell, something very sad in her life at that time. And when I saw her three months later, that blue spot was almost gone. And she told me this wonderful story about how the problem had been solved, the this, this sadness in her life. So I found it fascinating um, to see that well, energetic change in her scans. Here's what I think. I really truly yeah. believe that I think that 10 years from now, we're going to be interpreting these a lot differently. Mm. And I think there is so much to do with the energy field and so many things that we don't yet understand. And one of the things, um, uh, I'll give you an example, is um, the, we see that hypothermic area at T2 posteriorly. Yes. A loss. And it, it, it's associated mm. with immune dysfunction, autoimmune dysfunction. It's associated with cancer at times. Um, it's not specific, but it, it's associated with some immune issues in a lot of patients. And uh, I believe, John, we were, I was up in Tampa. We were at well, the acupuncturist office. Oh, and that's right. I forgot that you were there. I, I was medically speaking, about to relate that. Yeah, yeah there is ahead. no structure there. There is nothing there that's round that exists, right, from a medical anatomical point of view. And we were uh, giving a presentation at an acupuncturist office in Tampa, John and I, 
and um, the uh, the acupuncture said, "Oh yeah, that makes sense. That spot it has to do with uh, defense against the world." You know, it was so it made perfect sense to him why this little T two spot would be hypothermic. And what I really believe is that as this evolves and it's be it becomes better understood, that there are going to be more energetic pieces. It's not going to be the you know we're kind of interpreting this with sort of a conventional medical right we're looking for diseases we're looking it's a conventional medical mindset you know that general culture has but i think more and more there's going to be more energetic you have to understand the energy fields and a lot of different things that i'm convinced with all the myofascial activity we see and that kind of stuff that that we'll be able to tell a whole lot more things that we haven't even maybe imagined yet can I can you hear me yes this is Michelle um, I'm, I'm not actually a thermography but I've gotten it done I'm actually a, a lo location for a lady here in Houston who does it out of my office but when you said that about the energy um, that was actually my experience I had an iridologist tell me that she saw something in my eye for my breast and um, I actually do reflexology and she didn't she wasn't alarmed when she said it she said just get it checked out and try thermography and about six months later I was working on a client who had um, who had just had a baby and was having trouble breastfeeding so I was working on her and the baby started crying, so I asked her if she wanted to hold the baby while I worked on her, and she did. Well, the next morning, I had a pain in my breast that literally I couldn't even get out of the bed. And um, I went to see an acupuncturist, and it helped a little bit. But when I got the thermography done, um, it showed up, the heat showed up in the exact area of the pain. So um, I think I already had something going on, but I think it was the energy that I picked up from the from the mother mm -hmm. um, that made it heighten. And um, so then it was necessary to address it. Then it became an issue. <laughs> but um, I think it really is a factor. This is Vivi. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I am actually going on, uh, something is going on with me right now. I'm treating a woman and I'm a healer um, with the severe issues with her right leg. And the better she became, and I'm seeing her like eight months now, as worse my right leg is getting. So I start to think that I need to drop her. <laughs> I mean, it, it really reached the point that uh, I'm not working as I used to work, and I already forgot about my high heels. But she is a happy camper. <laughs> <laughs> so now when I, I'm entering to the um, thermography world, thank you to Pam, thanks to Pam, I'm wondering if, if I can see something. Um, I would say I don't know. I would say I would say there's only one way to find out. That's right. <laughs> Looking forward to. And the beauty of thermography is there's really no downside to it. We're not. It's what I call a completely receptive modality. Um, and by that I mean we're not exposing you to anything. We're not injecting you with anything. We're not touching you in any way. So there's really no downside to taking a look. Right. And I'm actually a mechanical engineer, have a master's degree in physics. So that is uh, kind of like falls just right where I am. Prevention, wellness, and, and technology. I'm extremely excited mm. from that opportunity. Thank you, Pam. <laughs> oh. <laughs> All right. Welcome aboard. <laughs> Thank you. All right, everyone, it's, it's about 8.30, um, so we've been on for about an hour. Any last questions for uh, Dr. Tom or Dr. John before we wrap things up tonight?
Anyone? All right. Well, with that, uh, I just want to say thank you, uh, John and Tom. That was uh, just a great overview. I appreciate your time and um, excellent information. So thank you very much for doing that for all of us.